The CDC is back with a new paper. It's out in MMWR. It's the talk of the town. People are tweeting about it. They're commenting on it. They're pushing it. It's entitled Cardiac Complications After SARS-CoV-2 Infection and mRNA COVID-19 Vaccination. And it's the latest CDC paper to try to compare the two things. What is the rate of myocarditis or pericarditis after vaccination versus after getting infected with the virus. And they're trying to say in this paper that it's way, way higher if you get the virus. And so that's the conclusion. That's the takeaway message that everyone's running with. Well, there are a number of problems with this paper number of big problems. But first, I just got to say, this is a silly genre of literature. This is not the question anyone needs to be asking. The question should always be, if you have had COVID-19, if you haven't had COVID-19, how many doses do you benefit from? That's the relevant question. If you haven't had COVID-19, it is very clear that most adults benefit from that first dose, huge reduction in severe disease and hospitalization. The next question is, when should they get dose two? Is it different if you're an adolescent boy? Should you get it on day 21 or day 28? If you're an 85-year-old woman, I think it's very clear. You should get those doses. You should get your booster. You may even want to consider that fourth dose. If you're a 22-year-old adolescent, I think it is not as clear. And if you've had one dose or two doses and an Omicron infection, do you benefit from the booster? Is there a net benefit to you from getting that additional dose? What is the further reduction in severe disease and hospitalization? What's the downside of myocarditis? So that's the relevant question. But let's entertain them for a minute. Somewhere along the line, somebody decided to say that no matter how bad myocarditis is after the vaccine, it's always worse from getting COVID-19. And I think they said that because it's a simple way to take away the whole dilemma. If it is true that myocarditis is always worse with the virus than it is with the vaccine in any circumstance, then you don't even need to consider myocarditis after the vaccine. And that's where this paper comes in. And lo and behold, it concludes that myocarditis after infection is way, way higher than after the vaccine. But here's my number one problem with it. This is a paper that looks at the electronic health record of many, many people across America. And it looks at 15 million people. And they make several pots One, people who've had a documented SARS-CoV-2 infection, PCR antigen test within that electronic healthcare system. Also, people who've had one dose, people who have two doses, people who had perhaps more doses, and a category where they say is any mRNA vaccination. We can put that aside for a second. We can just focus on the people who've had one and two doses and the group that has had infection. Now, of all these 15 million people, they say something like 800,000 people have a documented infection in the EHR. But of 15 million people in America, do 800,000 people have had infection? Is that the right number, the right ratio? Less than one in 15 people, less than a million. Is that the right ratio? Well, of course, we know from many, many sources that a lot more Americans have had COVID-19. The CDC said, you know, pre-Omicron, we're talking 140 million Americans. It might even be higher thereafter. So that's kind of a low number. And that suggests that they're not capturing all of the infections. They're capturing some of the infections, just the people who went in to the hospital system to be tested in the hospital system, not people who tested at home and not people who didn't test at all. And they're analyzing the rates of myocarditis in this cohort. I've tried to explain this, and I think there's a lot of difficulty in uh, understanding it. So I've tried to make a visual. Here's the visual. The first picture, I'm going to show it right here. Imagine these are all the people who've had COVID-19. The next picture, imagine that some of those people have suffered myocarditis after COVID-19 infection and inflammation of the heart. It's not so good. They're depicted with a red heart on them. And now let's imagine that we do a data analysis. We're trying to estimate the rate and we capture people who have a documented SARS-CoV-2 infection within the hospital EHR system, within the healthcare EHR system, not people who took a test at home that they bought from Target or Walgreens, not people who didn't test at all, like many, many adolescents may not test at all, or they may take a home test. Those are not captured in this data set. Are those the people who are likely to have very severe SARS-CoV-2 that could lead to things like cardiac complications? Or are they potentially the people who've had more mild or asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 and in whom they are much less likely to have myocarditis? And the answer is they're probably enriched with the people who didn't have the bad event. And so if you select just the people who you have collected data from in your EHR, you're very likely to inflate your estimate of myocarditis. You're very likely to be missing the vast majority of the denominator. Now, let's think again about the vaccine. Now, they don't have everyone who got a vaccine. That's also a limitation of their study. They just have some people who got a vaccine, the people they know who got a vaccine because they administered it in their healthcare settings. And they know the rate of myopericarditis in that group. 
and that rate is roughly in the one to 3,000 to 15,000 ballpark from dose two, which is consistent with estimates from Norway and Ontario province and Hong Kong and Israel. It's consistent with a number of global estimates. And we also know Moderna's higher than Pfizer. That's why many people wonder why Moderna's even offered in this country for young men. Why don't we just restrict its use uh, to older people and just give Pfizer? Uh, we know it's higher with dose two. We also know from Ontario data that there's an association between delaying the second dose and having a lower myocarditis rate. We also know that there's some rate you're never going to get below because there is a rate from the booster, which happens many, many months later. We know all these things. And so when they select people in whom they know have been vaccinated, the question is, are those likely to be similar to people who are vaccinated in other settings, maybe in a uh, you know, booth on the street, maybe in a Walgreens, maybe in uh, their employer, maybe somewhere else? And the answer is, I see no reason to think that the vaccine cohort is different than the average person who's vaccinated. And I have a point estimate of myocarditis after vaccination that is roughly compatible with every single well-done estimate from the globe. So I believe that that's probably not that far from the truth. On the other hand, I have an estimate of myocarditis after the infection that is different than other places in the globe. I'm going to show you a figure right now comparing this to the estimate from the United Kingdom, the Nature Medicine Study. This is comparing myocarditis post-infection. The Nature Medicine Study had one difference. They were looking at hospitalized myocarditis post-infection. But I, I really do wonder, is there somebody so sick with SARS-CoV-2 that they've had myocarditis from SARS-CoV-2 and they're not being hospitalized in the U.S.? I think the, these are probably pretty compatible, that the entity that we're looking at is fairly compatible. And yet, in this study, it is 50 times higher in this graph. You'll see 50 times higher in this study. Something doesn't add up here. The vaccine-induced myocarditis estimate is consistent with other global estimates. The post-infection myocarditis estimate is vastly higher than other estimates. That's very likely on the fact, based on the fact that you're only selecting people who are presenting to healthcare systems to be tested. Those aren't likely to be the average person with an average infection. They're likely to be the sickest people because that's why they're going into the healthcare setting. They want more than just the SARS-CoV-2 test. They want you to try to make them feel better because they don't feel good and you might have to hospitalize them. And in that cohort, I have no doubt there's going to be more troponin billing claims. And this is the next part of it. We are talking about billing claims. These are claims submitted for reimbursement from insurers. They're not perfect. And on a prior video, I talked to Katie Scharf, who went deep into the weeds about what happens when you pick up all these cases with billing claims. There are two types of errors that you are including things that are not myocarditis at all. They're just totally uh, some other clinical entity. I don't want to say they're miscoded, but they are uh, coded very loosely or vaguely. They're not myocarditis. You're also, you're also, um, uh, so, so you're including things that are not really the, the entity you care about. You're also missing some things. You're missing things because the billing claims came late, which she talks about because uh, it was actually initially coded as chest pain and then somebody coded as myocarditis later. You're missing some things. So I have no doubt that there are both errors of omission and errors of uh, uh, false in, of wrong inclusion uh, in, in this data set. I have no doubt that that's true for both entities. Um, I do think that for the illness entity, it's going to be a little bit different than for the post-vaccine entity because when somebody is very sick with SARS-CoV-2 and they are in, hospitalized, it is possible that somebody is going to check a cardiac enzyme test and they're going to see that's elevated and they're going to struggle to know what to code that as. Is, is, that, is that myocarditis? Uh, is that just, uh, it's, it's not a myocardial infarction. So what are we going to code that as? And so they may drift towards coding, you know, that as a myocarditis event, but it's not the same thing as the classic vaccine induced myocarditis clinical presentation, 12 year old, a 16 year old gets the vaccine three days later, they wake up in the middle of the night with crushing substernal chest pain. They're otherwise totally healthy and normal. They go and get hospitalized, et cetera, et cetera. That's a very unique clinical entity. But Katie, I think explained nicely in that video, how you can have this dilemma. These authors, you know, and people who cite this work, they say that because the data set is so large, you know, because it's so large, it's a better study than other studies. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. If you adjudicated every single case you're scoring in the numerator and denominator, if you adjudicate every case by hand in duplicate with doctors looking through the charts, it's a better study. I don't see that you've done that. I see you've taken a very coarse pass at this data set. So you're running a very coarse analysis. So what are my overall thoughts with this paper? 
I mean, you know, what can I say? There's a reason it's an MMWR, which is not exactly what I consider a uh, strong journal these days. It's a journal that's published a lot of flawed studies, and those are studies that happen to, coincidentally, um, go with the CDC's uh, goal. And what is the CDC's goal? You know, it is not necessarily a terrible goal. It might be a noble goal, but they say in their tweet, their goal is that everyone over the age of five should be fully vaccinated, whatever, however many doses that, that's, that's a constantly moving target. Um, that's what they say. They want those people to be vaccinated. And I certainly think that the CDC is right that we need to be focusing on vaccination, but they should be focusing on the right group. And that right group is people who have never had COVID-19, who are older. All their mental energy should be on that group because that group is extremely vulnerable and they need to take less mental energy on boosting 20-year-olds and all these things that have been going on. And the fourth dose in a healthy 51-year-old, that needs less mental, with, with no randomized control trial data that supports a reduction in hospitalization, they need less mental energy there. And they need to focus on the high-risk group that they can help. That is, I think, the core error. And this paper, I think, is just not very persuasive. Um, it's it's not really a good estimate at all of the number. I mean, anyone can quickly see that it's very likely they're missing a lot of infections. How many infections are they missing? I mean, the CDC elsewhere said that it might be four to one, you know, in terms of documented, counted infections to other infections. But in these younger ages, uh, I don't think we, we fully know how many we're missing. Is it four to one, five to one, seven to one, 10 to one? I don't know the answer. How much of the denominator we're missing? But I would be embarrassed to publish a rate when the denominator is grossly off. And it is different for one entity. There is a different selection filter than the other entity, where I don't think necessarily there's a rhyme or reason why people more prone to vaccine-induced myocarditis would be getting vaccinated in this EHR system versus elsewhere. Whereas I do think people more prone to myocarditis or severe cardiac manifestations after a severe illness are the ones getting tested in the EHR system. I do think that that's more likely to be the case. So that is a differential bias between the two cohorts making the comparison fraught. So those are my thoughts. One last thought. It's the people, the people pushing the retweets, etc. I mean, a very senior academic messaged me to say that, uh, that, that they've lost respect for a lot of people because they do not appear to be scientists. They appear to be people who have a preconceived agenda and they just want to push whatever flawed paper supports that. But anyone who spent a lot of time reading papers will be able to quickly tell if the paper is totally rubbish. And if you are promoting your agenda based on a rubbish paper, I don't think you're going to get far and you're going to lose the respect of your colleagues. Now, what do I think overall? I think that we are not focused on the right question. The right question is, depending on the clinical scenario in front of you, and depending on how many doses of vaccine somebody's already had, and how many, uh, how, and, and if they've had a breakthrough infection on top of that, how many additional doses do they benefit from? And if so, when? That's the clinical question. That's always been the clinical question. Always reassessing dose by dose. Do this, does this person benefit? Is there a net clinical benefit? Do we know that? What's the data that supports that? That's always the question. And getting into this battle between, you know, myocarditis post-infection, myocarditis post-vaccine, it's not useful. I think people pick the fight because if they could say it's always worse with infection than vaccine, they wouldn't have to face the more difficult issues, which is it is a non-trivial concern and we need to mitigate that risk. And European nations have managed to navigate this brilliantly. They have suspended one product, Moderna, in certain ages, not at all ages, because they suspended at the target ages. They have spread the doses apart, recommended the doses be spread. They've advised people who are very young and have had recent infection that, you know, we don't know for sure a vaccine dose will further reduce your risk of subsequent severe disease and hospitalization. And the CDC has published elsewhere data suggesting that somebody who had a natural infection has a very, very low rate of subsequent hospitalization from COVID-19, from reinfection. So those are just the way in which I think this paper is a distortion and the way in which we might want to focus on this issue. So that's it. Those are my thoughts on this paper. I think uh, flawed analysis. Uh, no offense to the authors, but I would be embarrassed to have written it. Um, the CDC is pushing it. Uh, of course they are. Um, and I think people are uncritically tweeting it, and that's a big problem. So until next time.